Welcome back, everybody. This is panel three for the um, Conflict Records Unit uh, conference, online conference on documenting war. Uh, the panel is on case studies in access um, and Colombia as case studies. I'd say that when we first put together the agenda, the case studies in access for panel three and case studies in evidence for panel four looked a little bit different. We had a, a, a wider range of um, of papers, and as we as we iterated that, um, basically case studies in access and case studies in evidence. Both panels are case studies in access and evidence, and other issues as well. Uh, but this was a a, um, a useful way to organize the uh, the second two panels, the second pair of panels of the the day. Um, for those of you who weren't there this morning, my name is Mike Innes. I'm a visiting research fellow with the Department of War Studies and in my non-academic professional life, I work as a UN official in Iraq with the UN investigative team for accountability of Daesh. Um, we have three panelists today, four panelists today. Uh, Liliana uh, Duica Amaya, apologies if I haven't pronounced that correctly, apologize to anybody if I get uh, names wrong, um, who is a visiting researcher at uh, the City University of New York, uh, as well as having other um, uh, other other affiliations, um, I'm just pulling up some details here so that I don't get anything wrong. Um, bear with me one second. With James Gregg, who's a uh, PhD candidate with uh, at the University of St. Andrews, um, and Oksana Mikheva and Victoria Sereda. Um, uh, Oksana, who are co-presenting, uh, Oksana is a professor at the Uni uh, European University, uh, Yadrina Frankfurt in Oder in Germany, and a professor of sociology at Ukrainian Catholic University in, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Can you, can you help me out? In, in uh, Lviv. 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 Okay. Lviv. Yeah. Apologies for my, for my linguistic incapacity. Uh, and Victoria is a fellow at the uh, Imre Kritesh College Jena and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Ethnology at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Um, I think in terms of the order of uh, presentation, we, ha we have two really interesting uh, papers on uh, different aspects of conflict in uh, Donbass uh, coming. Uh, and I think one, one is about localized production of knowledge. It's Victoria and Oksana's paper. And James is looking at ethics of um, uh, social uh, social media uh, as sources. That that presents a really interesting pairing of approaches um, in, in a in a similar uh, regional context. And then we have a third paper, which uh, which Liliana is uh, presenting on uh, an aspect of the FARC uh, guerrilla archives in Colombia, and in particular a, a missing piece of the archives um, that that you were able to uh, to work with, which is really interesting. Uh, um, uh, and in terms of order, um, it, I, I don't have a particular preference. I don't know if you do, but I, I'd like to start with um, Oksana and Victoria presenting their paper, and then with James, and we can do the pairing. And then the Columbia case, Liana, your paper presents, you know, sort of an, a, a different way of looking things as well, kind of a, a third way of looking things. And, and so it might line up uh, well enough that way. Um, does that work for everybody? Yes. Be very democratic about this. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, I'll hand over uh, just for everybody who is in the attendees, who are people who are listening in. Uh, if you have questions, please post them into the Q and A function. Uh, we'll allow fifteen minutes or so for fifteen, roughly fifteen or twenty minutes uh, for each of the papers, uh, and then we'll do Q and A after that. Um, so again, just post your questions into the Q and A, and those will be moderated. Um, uh, after after the paper presentations. And with that, I'll stop talking. Uh, and uh, Oksana and Victoria, the... Uh... Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to present. We are adding to your uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach here now as, as sociologists, uh, but also as historians, uh, in, in our background, so we, we can deal with both subjects uh, while we are discussing. Uh, and, and here we'll be presenting some 
analysis we done uh, about knowledge production and issues of knowledge production, especially for, in, for the peace building, but not only, uh, with the focus on uh, societies that are war and torn. And we were focusing when we applied for this conference, we didn't know what will happen to Ukraine. So we were focusing on Donbass and Crimea as tem temporary occupied territories. And now, of course, we have an absolutely new spin in our country. So here we will try to uh, add or discuss a little bit at the background with the literature. First of all, we are using literature about uh, local and practical turns in peace building, which are aiming at getting more knowledge from, from the local uh, experts or uh, local population. We will also uh, tap a little bit uh, on uh, how to discussion about the contribution of research and knowledge production uh, experts from academia to, to the public sphere or political sphere. And we mostly will be focusing on difficulties of conducting research and discussing issues connected to that. Of course, there are many, many different issues that can be discussed and we cannot target them within, within 15 minutes presentation. There are many questions, whom to study, uh, what should be studied when we are uh, trying to get information about war torn societies, about methodologies applied, uh, but also uh, who are those who are studying uh, or involved in the collection and ways of information functioning or dissemination. So we'll be tapping on these three last issues with our presentation. First of all, um, when we look at the papers or debates, there are a lot of uh, debates exactly about ability to uh, conflict sense, develop conflict sensibility, ability to understand the context of awareness of researchers' role, positionality in a given context. And in my part of presentation, I will be discussing exactly these issues and oh, challenges that we are we were facing and many are facing in this in this field. So um, here quite strongly comes to play such situation as a problem of uh, insider or outsider position of the researcher. Quite often in many reports or in, in many conferences I was attending research conducted by a scholar or institutional institutions external to the conflict is oft, often absolutely automatically valued as being allegedly more neutral and therefore more trustful. At the same time, if we look at the societies that function either un, under authoritarian regimes or, or in war torn regimes, uh, we understand that societies uh, are quite strongly built into a social network of trust that protect people from, uh, from atrocities and many different issues they are fa facing because of, of, the, of the regime or because of the war. And it is very difficult for strangers to, to get into those uh, networks. Uh, and at the same time, without getting into those networks, without getting into the networks of trust, we, we have limited access to information about what is happening to the society. So in this case, uh, getting meaningful information quite often requires someone to be acknowledged, uh, have someone to be trusted, and quite often this might be the local expert or person who understands local sensitivities, uh, who also uh, knows people who might serve as a conductors or gatekeepers to certain societies or societal groups which are inaccessible in, in otherwise. And uh, also what is, is very important that during the uh, discussions or talks or interviews, the person knows the language, how to address certain issues, how to pose questions, 
which immediately won't be recognized as offensive, as sensitive, or uh, will show that person doesn't know what, what is happening. This could be even the way how we name what is happening, how we name certain social phenomena around, and uh, this might really cause us a, a loss, a lot of information. So uh, furthermore, some researchers also think that there is no methodological difference between research conducted in a society with experience of war or uh, foreign occupation and the normal societies. So they come from outside and try to apply a methodologies they learn during their studies and think that this might or should work, why not, if we are uh, careful enough with uh, our uh, ethical aspects uh, and uh, excesses. Respondents and interiors uh, do not, they do not understand that res respondents and interiors might be arrested, tortured, killed at any moment for asking or answering a particular question. Uh, local knowledge is similarly important at the stage of the interpretation of respondents' narratives uh, and answers. Quite often, uh, it is very important to have contextualized knowledge uh, that needs to be weighted against the media and propaganda narratives. For example, just to bring one example, uh, during this Donbass conflict, there were uh, several stories uh, in my interviews when people were saying that we saw a lot of American soldiers on, on tanks uh, coming to our cities and killing people. Of course, we understand that this is propaganda narrative, but it's also very important not to dismiss these types of narratives because they look uh, like uh, fake or crazy narratives uh, going through, through propaganda machines. This is very important to know about them, to understand them and include them into the description because quite often uh, people uh, live according to what they believe or how they see surrounding reality or behave in accordance to how they perceive this reality. And if we need to have an information about the society in war, we also have to understand different realities, including those with, uh, which are heavily uh, included in, in propaganda narratives. Even if it, knows, it is not fact per se, it tells us a, a lot about everyday reality of the research participants and the facts uh, they might have on his uh, or her behavior. Having personal connection to the territory opens us access to the uh, different groups and circles of the societies. Uh, alerts us to appropriate vocabulary. However, rootedness in the society under study can also be very highly problematic. It is more difficult for local researcher to remain unlabeled by participants because even if we try to be neutral or play neutral roles, uh, quite easily we can be spotted as representatives or sympathizers of one of the sites and labeled this way. And if we are, we are labeled that, then of course, the information we will be acquiring will be already biased depending on the way how we are labeled by the participant. Uh, we also uh, then for the local researcher may face uh, another major challenges such as finding balance between the contextuality and autonomy. Autonomy of researcher might, must be manifested in distancing from the conflict uh, in being non-involved uh, in discourses uh, of war parties, maintaining the highest possible level of neutrality of assessment and adequate vocabulary in putting aside empathy for one or another side of the conflict. Uh, all this in general creates a complex internal conflict for the researcher, which for example, can manifest itself in the role of conflict between the researcher and the citizen. Equally difficult for local or external researcher is situation when participants perceive her or him either as a mediator 
uh, or uh, to inform who can inform stakeholders about the research participants problem or as a person who can provide assistance or as a spy gathering uh, intelligence information. Understanding these nuances makes uh, a very important building trust relationship and special understanding this new attention to the introductory part of the interview where researcher should clearly state his or her functions, role and project aims and also its limitations. Scholars insiders are confronted with a double pressure. On the one hand, they face pressure from the social political groups who try to censor information on the conflict. There is tension between the prospective reaction of some social groups to ongoing war, which results in demand to classify certain subjects uh, as sensitive or potentially dangerous for people uh, or state security or public debate and need of scholar to monitor the situation in, in all its complexity. Labeling of certain questions or topics as dangerous or separatist, while researcher programs became subjected to social security service inquiries. Uh, in, in a sense, field, uh, the field of what's possible to study, present publicly uh, for the researcher is narrowing. And uh, as Goshel takes its, its shrinking spaces for the researchers, or uh, we also have to deal with spaces of alternative facts, actually from media or from propaganda or state propaganda, as a counterversion of scientific results or facts we were studying. The other change, challenge for local uh, researcher is how to reconcile the scholarly need to hear different voices and later present them in their complexity and their own sense of social responsibility. And finally, I will just briefly mention certain dilemmas we are dealing with uh, knowledge uh, circulation. If we are talking about academia, in academia, we always have a long term debates and uh, we are dealing with ethical issues. For example, right now, uh, our colleagues from, from Warsaw who wanted to study Ukrainian refugees in Warsaw, we are dealing with ethical committee which didn't allow them to start interviewing for three months. And uh, we also have similar issues here in Germany. So uh, before we can go to the field work, uh, we uh, deal and have to answer a lot of ethical questions, methodological questions, and so on. At the same time, the knowledge production uh, is uh, for the, especially for the knowledge, uh, for the peace building initiatives is needed exponentially with the local turn. So uh, then this knowledge collection and knowledge production function is quite often outsourced to uh, different other stakeholders. This would mainly be non-government organizations and similar civil society institutes, which are not uh, going or working with sometimes with all these ethical questions and methodological issues. And in addition to that, uh, when they apply for different grants or granted money for collecting data, the requirement would be to make the knowledge they produce as public as possible. So if scientific knowledge for us to publish an article or book will take two, three years, a lot of peer reviewing, a lot of ethical committees and so on, and quite often this knowledge will be also uh, in the close access, so people would have to pay to get access to the, this knowledge. The knowledge that is produced without uh, checks and balances quite often but by NGOs or some local activists would immediately go to media and create an image about what is happening to the society and inform a lot of uh, peace building and other type of policy papers uh, on the situation. And I will stop here and give floor to Oksana. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And first of all, I would like to say that it's a great pleasure for me to be here and to participate in such great discussion. In my presentation, in my part of presentation, I would like to propose to talk about the problems and issue of research design and data collection in the context of war. I would like to emphasize that we talk about our research, Victoria mentioned it, uh, we uh, discussed about our research experience in Ukraine from uh, 2014, when the first wave of Russian aggression against Ukraine began, and to the beginning of the full-scale war in February 2022. The first uh, challenge facing sociologists working in the war situation is the choice between quantitative and qualitative methods of data collection. Uh, quantitative data sets allow exploring important trends and defining casual relations between phenomena and focus. However, when planning such a study, one should be aware that standard survey for a uh, 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 it's not possible, it's not effective in situations of external aggression. Uh, one of the key challenges relates to the in inability to build a representative sample for a number of reasons. Typically, conflicts cause a very intensive movement of population, seeking from temporary shelters of humanitarian aid, running from one to the conflict sites, forced displacement, military or job recruitment, cause big mass population to move. In case of Ukraine, escaping from political or physical persecution of military action, a part of population from Crimea Peninsula and from parts of territory of Donetsk and Lugansk districts flee to other regions of our country. Uh, if you mention it, I use the uh, clear terminology to what the situation, for example, in Ukraine, and Victoria says about this, the terminology play a very important role. For example, when we describe the situation in east part of Ukraine, we don't use the term Donbas, which are absolutely artificial construct, but now we uh, very often use uh, the full name of this territory. We talk about parts of territory of Donetsk and Lugansk region, which are not under control by Ukrainian government. Uh, approximately 2.4 million inhabitants of Crimea and three from three to 3.5 million inhabitants of temporary occupied territories of Donetsk and Lugansk districts found themselves behind the new uh, dividing lines. Two quasi-state formation in the occupied territories cover a third of the territory of Donetsk and Lugansk districts, which was home to more than half of their pre-war population of roughly 6.5 million people. But no reliable statistic is available to prove or correct these numbers. Uh, with uh, limited accessibility to the temporary occupied territories, data on those who fled abroad, high percentage of no, non-registered IDPs, and intensive cross-contact line mobility, it is impossible to define general population and, as a result, to specify a sample and sample error. In the situation of uh, undefined general population, a random or systematic sample would be a solution, but in condition of fair and limited access to the population of the temporary occupied territories, this is dangerous for interviewers and researcher participants. Another possible technique to be employed under such circumstances would be telephone interview based on random sampling. This type of interviewing is suffer for interviewers uh, as it does not require travel to the war on territories, but it's still uh, in dangerous research participants. To phone call can be, uh, can be hacked and their voice uh, and or answer be recorded and uh, matched with the SIM card data. Moreover, it is difficult to build a deeper trust relationship through uh, impersonalized telephone call. Respondents might be afraid that they are not sociologists, but military or secret services checking their reality, because and it's absolutely correspond to their real life on occupied territory. Therefore, it is difficult to expect that our interlocutors would be ready to give unconventional answers during such telephone conversation. Another possible solution is to conduct face-to-face -face interviews through trust networks following the quarter or snowball technique with anonymized questionnaires, but this technique might lead to unpredictable bias in sample, because in this case there is a very high risk of remaining within the social bound, and the data obtained will only characterize the situation in this one small group. Another problem is that under such condition, it is impossible to perform a routine quality control procedure of field work. Uh, it does not mean that quantitative studies are not possible in war zone. 
But when one decides to employ it, one has to understand all limitations with something, response rate, challenges and dangers of fieldwork, limits of issue that can be discussed without putting respondents in the life threatening situation. Surveys usually give us a distribution of answer to the question, which is already more or less established in public opinion. The situation in war zone or occupied territories is that active conflict is characterized by high dynamic of change and a significant level of uncertainty. Therefore, neither the sociologists can formulate the questions that are settled, finalized, nor the research participants are able to provide clear answer being located in the heart of an uncertain situation. Situation. Moreover, having a clear position in such conditions can pose a direct threat to human life. So the problem is to the ethical aspect of such research. And we all talk about ethic issue because it's really very important. And it's a red line which started when we start formulating our research question and before they are producing our result of the research. This marks the need in activation of the debate of ethical knowledge obtaining in the field of peace peacekeeping. All these issues are usually discussed in academic publication, Victoria says about this, so readers could access limitation of, of, of presented data. At the same time, in policy reports or in media, they are often missing. So peace practitioners or media take those outcomes for granted. It's a very big uh, issue uh, in this context. The choice, the choice in favor of more flex, uh, flexible qualitative method or ethnographic research is also full of challenges. Flexible research methodologies allow to make change uh, in the research tools in the course of the field work to follow the respondent, but at the same time possess a lot of questions about the safety of the researchers and research participants, encourage reflection on the influence of researchers and how he or she is identified by the research participants on the outcome of this study. Then, it is important to discuss difficulties uh, involved in finding research participants, their availability, and the reason for agreeing to participate. Uh, uh, in our context, it's very important because usually if we uh, conduct interview with person who live on occupied territory, uh, people who are not agree with this reality usually don't want to communicate with other specialists and talk about the experience because they are really afraid. On the one hand, individual formats of cooperation between researcher and research participants become much more important as it allows to create an atmosphere of trust, allow participants to speak more openly and in detail about the experience, often personal and psychologically difficult. On the other hand, collective forms of flexible methodologies of focus group dyadic interviews are problematic for employing them in societies from occupied or wartime areas where people may face denunciation uh, and may be tortured, where they live in condition of high distrust of anyone in the immediate surrounding and therefore may perceive other participants as a potential threat. I understand that it takes so much time and of course uh, we have not enough time to discuss all issue in this case, but let me say maybe last uh, statements here, uh, what could uh, be to approach to solving this problem. From my point of view, the model of intersectional collaboration in much more uh, is much more productive under this uh, condition, which by involving various actors, external, internal researchers, civil society representatives, peace building practitioners, uh, in the implementation of the project, activates and engage various identities in the research processes, which can open the way to potential par uh, participants and create the necessary conditions of trust and openness. Such collaboration is equally important at the stage of interpretation of the collected data, since the researcher who is not rooted in the context, uh, in most cases that not, uh, the, does not read cliches, intertext, sarcasm, uh, it is not sensitive to degrees of pretenses, etc. This is where I would like to stop to, to leave time for discussion, I hope, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Victoria and Oksana. Certainly a really dense and, and sort of on the nose um, 
co-presentation on problems of access and evidence. I, I think that's a good setup for the rest of the panel. Uh, I'm going to just allow James just to step right in and uh, and and carry on with his paper. Uh, Oksana Victoria, if I could ask you just to close your video while James is presenting. Same for everybody. If you're not presenting, just mute your mic and turn your camera off. Thank you, Mike. I'll just go ahead and, and jump on in. Um, good afternoon. Um, as a PhD candidate, I'm particularly honored to be here listening and learning from this wonderful panel. Um, as the title of my contribution reads, uh, I wrote about ethical considerations that I had to deal with in examining uh, a social media account of a Russian-backed separatist militia called Sparta Battalion. As the war in Ukraine has released this flood of conflict imagery, I think academics in particular are required to exercise um, restraint and introspection before proliferating conflict imagery as a research product. In the legal aspect and in the intelligence field, it's, these are different considerations, obviously, but in my world, these are things that I had to be confronted with uh, or else risk uh, exploiting or circulating images that could be potentially harmful. Um, studying this imagery is obviously important. Um, it's, it lets us know how this war is going. Uh, nonetheless, sharing these images can be potentially problematic. When I started my project, particularly in the conflict studies world out of Scotland, no one had really heard of Sparta Battalion. This is obviously not true in Ukraine, as they were in the newspapers uh, and, and videos from very early on in the conflict. This has since changed um, since the February escalation or invasion, how you ever wish to describe it, um, and the death of some of their leaders who were honored by Putin. Um, there's more international attention on them now. But back in 2014 and 2015, the group was only one of really a wide field of different Apolchensi uh, battalions, this concept of Russian migrant fighters who leave Russia to go and fight abroad in service of Russian geopolitical aspirations. Um, there were dozens of these groups, each coming up with their own naming conventions, their own uniforms, their own military traditions. They're really starting from scratch, but trying to choose what they like to create this sort of unit cohesion. Um, and they also came with their own understanding of what they were fighting for and how they imagined Donbass as this concept to be, both physically, politically, geographically, and socially. Um, studying them, in my mind, uh, is a key element to understanding Russian hybrid warfare and tactics um, and mobilization of irregular forces as a precursor to larger invasions and really setting the groundwork for a lot of their political narratives um, that we see echoed today. Um, with these, as the Ukrainian government considers these to be illegal military formations, you have a very top-down uh, system. The FSB assisted these men in getting weapons, kit, and transport. Um, but upon arrival, they created their own culture. Um, some of these cultures were successful, others evaporated um, and could not replace casualties or leavers, people who essentially went home. Um, others were folded into other more regular units of the armies, uh, so-called of, of Nova Russia. Sparta Battalion is a successful example where they found a brand. They use technology efficiently to recruit um, and through social media, photographs and memes in particular, they told a story that was consumable, mobilizing, understandable, and within the parameters of what the Kremlin deemed to be the acceptable story, but with a, a level of freedom on the ground to really make it their own. Um, the group was named interestingly after a unit from the novel and video game series Metro, which takes place in a post-nuclear Moscow, where heroes fight evil monsters and inhabit the bombed out rubble and are living also in the metros of the city. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Stalker genre of film, video games, and literature. Sparta Battalion sort of applied this ready-made genre onto themselves and the imaginings of Donbass to contextualize their presence and to depict Donbass as, a, as an um, imagined concept of Donbass as this site of apocalypse and post-Soviet disaster that had needed to be saved uh, to strike a romantic, adventuresome interest of, of young men to really make them choose to come and fight, along with many other narratives uh, as well. In essence, you, you got to play on video games as Spartans, killing Nazis and monsters online, now is your chance to do it. Uh, it even looks the same. And this was a concerted effort. Uh, they really did this on purpose. Um, the, so the project in, as a total examines this messy, imperfect, sometimes contradictory photo narratives that they 
deconstruct um, how they utilize social media as a digital site of memory. Uh, and it was also an opportunity to examine my own positionality relative to Sparta Battalion, and U the Ukraine conflict in general, um, and some of the inconvenient parts of that um, and the anxieties that come with being an outsider looking in. The corpus of the work was 2000, is 2000 to 3000 photographs posted to the Russian social media page from 2015 to 2020. The images show combat, um, concerts, cultural events, funerals, meal times, field trips, most things that you can imagine. They curate this experience online almost as a sort of wartime daily archive. It's a deliberate act, what they choose to show, what they choose not to show. Um, it's, it's, it's a propaganda construction, you know, clearly. It's not a representation of real life or uh, an aspect of Ukrainian culture. It, it's, it's a product, it's a political product. Um, as a methodological framework, uh, I use a, used a close reading method developed by Rose and Monica, where these images on social media are almost interpreted as a moving scene of political performance. The social media page flows shot by shot, characters are introduced, they are removed, scenes are constructed, and they tell a story of what the group wants to communicate to a very broad audience of, of the enemy, uh, which is very deliberately the United States, Ukraine, and, and Europe for those who they think would be against their motives, and also to attract people, uh, particularly young men um, in Russia and within um, the occupied territories themselves. They're still producing images to this day. So tapping into these images obviously raised serious ethical considerations. And I encountered some friction with my university. Most universities require ethical review boards to you know, approve before even touching these materials. Um, I really dove into the literature on ethical standards and practices for social media. And it became pretty evident to me that most people who do social media research are not working in conflict. Um, they tend to be business management, computer sciences, sociology, and anthropology. Uh, I'm actually an area studies and culture guy, so it's, it, was, it was definitely a new language to learn. Um, and there's been some bad practices in the past that they're still learning from. I found the ethics literature to be particularly reactive, you know, make mistakes first and then change uh, things later. And that the internet was considered to be this free forum of, of publicly available information, just like the street, and you could just take it. Um, we don't really think that way much anymore. But uh, in with Sparta Battalion in particular, I had to choose whether or not to get their consent to use their material. And the hardline institutional answer was, yes, I, I did have to get consent. And uh, this was their property. This, they are human beings. Um, if I wanted to use their likeness to interpret it, uh, I needed to grant them rights of withdrawal. Uh, I also had data privacy concerns. I needed term limits on how to use these images. I needed uh, gatekeeping access protocols for compliance with GDPR, uh, all of these things. And that's, that really hit me the wrong way. Um, you know, but it comes under this concept that uh, normal people sh are not, do not have to be a part of your research. They can just exist. Uh, I disagreed with this in the case of Sparta Battalion on six points. Um, I did not need to get their consent for point one. The page was run by individuals, not by individuals, excuse me, by a social media member or manager who's in essence an agent of the narrative that they're trying to construct. Um, two was the highly politicized nature and public interest really makes them pub political enemies within the public domain and as such considered exempt from some protections. Risks to the Spartans is relatively low. They have bigger problems right now. They're in violent interchange uh, with, with Ukrainian armed forces. Um, VK has a site culture that is open rather than Instagram and Facebook where pages are typically private upon creation. VK has a site culture that's default open and you you scale down to security. Um, asking for consent of Sparta Battalion may further validate the political recognition of the group, which is something my own political positionality uh, I could not do. Um, also asking for their consent could create a unsafe attention for me as the researcher. I could open myself up to a cyber attack or potential harassment or things that can be quite nasty from uh, Russia's cyber capabilities. My university agreed with these terms, and I was able to use their materials without asking for their consent. 
but I still had re other requirements on data storage and um, who I could show the image to before the final research product. However, this exercise in arguing why I did not need to get their consent really sort of um, kind of made me reflect upon the deeper questions here. Uh, you know, what could I show? Um, and I found that I really couldn't just use a, well, collaborate with them as, a, as this best practices fix, because I, I, how can you collaborate in this regard with you know, an active group that you're opposed to? Um, and I could not objectively relate to them. Um, that, was, that would be an illusion to say that I have this researcher from nowhere and I don't have biases or I don't have a political identity. Um, that was kind of a futile exercise. So when these images still had power, you know, we know this, you know, they have propaganda effects, uh, but the images themselves can also be very affecting. And in my opinion, taking possession of what can be the most horrific moment of a person's life, the destruction of their home or sites of memory or even their corpse, and then using it in a presentation or a paper casually. And we see this in universities and, and presentations, I think can be really dehumanizing and diminishes the human cost of, of the war um, in Ukraine. Uh, Sparta Battalion uses these bodies, alive and dead, as political props. Um, so they needed to be represented and discussed, but I didn't want to be participatory in that action. Um, I also needed to think about how these images reflected on Ukraine as a whole. Sparta Battalion's interpretation of Donbass as a site of apocalyptic war was a bit different from what I saw in Donbass. And my Ukrainian friends and colleagues have a uh, from that region in particular, have a low grade disdain for this type of visuality coming from their home oblasts. Um, and there's a legitimate frustration there when an outside person takes this image, attributes this geopolitical and cultural weight to it, uh, and then presents it to this outside world. And they don't really have much of, of a say. Um, and this was particularly before the recent escalation. So I needed to think about who the vulnerable parties were uh, in these images um, and disarm the stereotypes and propaganda within them. Uh, I also wanted to find a way to embody how I looked at these images to confront directly my own subjectivities and study them with an intensity of looking. Interpreting images, uh, particularly of conflict, is subjective and politically informed. Uh, and though I empirically ground my research, I wanted to resist an authoritative final reading on them. Um, so last summer, I was attending a research residency in Pakrovsk in Donetsk Oblast in the Ukrainian um, government's controlled side. And they've been dealing with these questions and anxieties for eight years, working in the local Krajewiczewski Musei. Uh, and they, they actually encouraged me to draw. You know, I talked about this, I'm like, what am I gonna do? And they said, just, just draw it. And um, drawing them also really kind of solved the problem, which was it made access to these images not as easy. You know, people who had an interest in my research who just wanted to look at the juicy pictures uh, would be disappointed, but others who wanted to contribute or critique uh, my work could do so as the drawings are cited to the originals. So it would just require the extra step, which would give them that moment of pause to think, why am I accessing this imagery? Um, is this a voyeuristic thing? Um, or is this like, you know, there's a lot to say and there's legitimate reasons to do so, but I think it was a little bit of a safety on, on the information weapon um, that was before them. Uh, it also, drawing the images also made me think more about what I was seeing and what I wanted to represent. Uh, showing the images as drawings removes their attractive power while still being illustrative. Um, and more importantly, it obfuscates the identities of any potentially innocent people. Although I could do the work without the consent of Sparta Battalion, they also often use bystanders, children, people who uh, are arguably victims of their uh, min propaganda construction as well. And I couldn't in good faith use that material. So in the end, I, I, I chose to, in my research product, chose to show their pictures as, as drawings. Um, I'll show also artwork from uh, Ukrainian artists and some of my colleagues and the textual analysis, of course, of Sparta, Sparta's work, uh, rather than just a photo catalog of their propaganda from year to year. And while this isn't a perfect system and sort of brings back the, the war illustrator of the 19th century, but with a sort of self-awareness and a definite lack of artistic skill, um, it seems to be working in this particular case for Sparta Battalion's military activities. Uh, I have like a minute left. I would like to show you some of these drawings because I'm sure some of you may be interested in just very briefly. I'm gonna switch over to share my screen here. Uh, yep, start broadcast.
three, two, one. So I don't know if sees that. So this image really kind of started me on this path. Uh, I was drawing a, a brigade of coal miners out of Pakrosk region from the 1980s. It was a vulnerable archive. And I kind of felt bad that these, these people didn't exist or they couldn't be found anymore. And I didn't want to use their, their likeness in my research product without their informed consent. So I decided to kind of draw them as a representation. This is a very common image uh, taken, again, I'm not an artist, so like, don't get excited, but you know, this is a, the most used image in all of their VK feed. They reproduce it about six, six times over and over again. Um, they really kind of punctuate this image of this man kneeling by a stairwell, uh, poking his AKS-74 out of a window. Um, this is a ritual that they perform where they burned uh, a coffin draped in the American Ukraine and, and European Union flag. Um, they nailed the flags to the coffin and then lit it on fire with some sort of flammable chemical. Um, this is kind of a, a lighter photo. This is a war correspondent here. He runs the Telegram channel War Gonzo. I'm sure you can look him up. This is the former commander of Vladimir Zhoga who is uh, killed in March. This is a folk singer who came and gave a, a concert for the guys in a parking garage of the bombed out uh, Donetsk airport. And these are just two other people standing along. So these images kind of are stand-ins for illustrative points when I talk about the narrative arcs um, in their photo, uh, photo elicitation, essentially. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I'm gonna say about that. That's my, that's my spiel. And I'm looking forward to the discussion period later. Thank you very much, everyone. James, thank, thanks very much. That was absolutely fascinating and intriguing for a few different reasons. But uh, you know, as with the, the earlier presentation, I'll save my questions until after, and we'll just transition straight away to Liliana and then come back to it. Um, Liliana, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, my name is Liliana <clears throat> Duica. Uh, um, I work in issues related to environment and violence. Uh, my PhD was in anthropology, and my main uh, interest was to understand uh, some of the weapon, weapons fabricated by FARC. I decided to, to go with landmines, and once I just uh, was analyzing doing like long period of, um, of, a, of ethnography, of field work, I just realized, uh, and I coined this concept of landmine landscapes that I wanted just to share because doing this, I just uh, archives appear. So I, my, my, I was, I, I am political scientist and geographer, and my PhD is in anthropology. So I don't, I don't have the background as an, as a historian, but I discovered this field of um, ethnography. Uh, of archives, so treating this as a as a source, so it was very interesting. So, first, I just want just to geolocate you. I just want to check the time. Yes. Okay. So, oh, uh, this is Colombia, the northernmost part of South America, coast in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and also in the Atlantic. We have like a big area uh, in the south. That is the Amazon we share with Brazil and Peru and Ecuador. Um, this, uh, this first is a natural reservation, so forests. Uh, this is uh, natural parks. These are um, collective territories uh, of indigenous and Afro-Colombian in Colum Af 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 uh, These are coca crops and not updated uh, layer. Uh, now we have more coca crops, and there is a, a strong relation between coca crops and, as you can see, landmines. So this is blue, red. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with these layers uh, overlaid, what you can see is that landmines are in the most of uh, in the biodiverse spots, and also there are a relation between like conflict uh, spaces. And of course, landmines. Landmines were mainly uh, fabricated by FARC guerrillas, but not only by them. My ethnographical focus was uh, in the Amazon mainly, and in this uh, in that area, uh, FARC guerrillas, the Eastern Bloc and the Southern Bloc were the main 
uh, structures, military structures there. Uh, what I did is ethnography for a long period uh, here in Guaviare, Caquetá, in Putumayo, in the, in the border. So I analyzed, um, I, I did my ethnography there uh, with the mining trainers, the, the Norwegian, the um, Dutch, some other, some international demining uh, companies. Um, and once I was doing my ethnography, I just find that some people uh, saw me as an outsider and they just want, oh, I just want to share this. And they show me some, uh, some of these handbooks. Uh, one of the things that I just discovered more interesting that my, 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 my span of time was 2014, 2020, and my ethnography uh, period was 2016, 2019. So it's just after the peace process. So the people was willing to talk. Uh, this is FARC. They did. This is the longest uh, guerrilla in the world. They demobilized in 2016. So it um, matched with my uh, with my period doing field work, and that was very interesting because. The information was available and people was willing to talk even the the same guerrilla just had um at that time they published all the 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 their archives now they are not available i was just checking that information but they have this <clears throat> web page uh where they just uh, tell their the story but at the at the very beginning they have all the uh, the conference and all strategic documents but not those related to to explosives that those those kind of um, of handbooks was was were the the things that I just find uh, doing field work. The other thing to have access is the uh, we had we have here the court that is created after the peace process, and they even have like a section a macro case that as they call it of uh, anti personal landmines. And the other thing is that uh, former far combatants created a um, a group uh, of uh, demining so that allow to the, the uh, to researchers to have a, a quite amount of information available that it was not uh, before um, with that idea i just created this concept uh, based on anthropological um, perspective, not only field work that I did, and this is, for instance, a gallon kind of mine in this Hermosa Meta, uh, like protecting a bunker of FARC at that time. But uh, at the time, I just took the picture. They were demining the, the, the bunker, so you can access and ask so many questions why you have bags here and whatever you think it's possible, I can ask. So it was very fruitful, my, 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 my field work doing that um so the idea of analyzing this as a landscape it is that uh, as you all maybe are very well aware uh, this kind of weapons uh, work as a as a network as a strategy to uh, feel make make the enemy feel that the space uh, is um, surrounded by weapons uh, so at this time they just uh, play with deceiving. So I just wanted to figure it out. What were the guerrilla uh, cunning strategies to fabricate, to lay, to camouflage, and to mark landmines. What I just found uh, doing that work is not only FARC guerrillas or guerrillas in Latin America, but this is a, an international uh, knowledge flow that is a pattern in some other guerrillas. And that, uh, that is why it was so interesting to find uh, this kind of um, material just to connect things that <clears throat> we were aware by uh, docu documentation and some um, studies about link international leaks of guerrillas. <clears throat> the landmines fabricated by FARC were all IEDs, but um, uh, the, the thing that, uh, there is a technical issue, but all the, the FARC um, uh, landmines were uh, fabricated um, improv in an improvised manner, and not not all are uh, homemade exp have homemade explosives. Some of them, depending on the place of the country they are, for, there are, for instance, in in the border with uh, Ecuador, there are a lot of smuggling of uh, plastic explosives, for instance, and they just have the, the mines of that area belonging to that structure at that time. 
uh, had more content of some specific kind of explosives. And this is the thing that I just want uh, the, the, the focus the focus I had on my on the on the writing uh, on the piece. And it's why by connecting all the dots that I just uh, find, I just uh, really like uh, the presentations um, from all of you, uh, but particularly some of the, of the um, at the beginning of the Chinese interest, uh, analyzing uh, documents of, of Mao, for instance, uh, Mao, Mao's uh, popular warfare was a trend in all guerrillas in the world, the popular warfare, uh, but in Colombia it was very interesting to see translated um, this uh, resistance, uh, Vietnamese resistance uh, handbook uh, in Spanish in an editorial of uh, Colombia that is, is called Black Sheep, uh, and all the translation was uh, uh, was um, done in um, in Cuba. So there are a lot of things uh, regarding which kind of text do you see. So all the attritional warfare uh, in in far guerrilla comes from a reading of Mao through Vietnamese eyes. So you can see that in other, I, I did not do, do like a lot of uh, research of that in my in my thesis, I just mentioned, because there are all the FMLN, that is the Salvadorian guerrilla, Frente Farabundo um, de Liberación eh, Nacional, and all the relations with guerrillas in Latin America, reading all this text in, uh, in Asia, and you can see like the patterns, the dots connecting with uh, handbooks in, uh, of explosives uh, in Colombian guerrillas. And also uh, there are uh, some of the connections, not only in the fabrication, in the homemade explosives, but also in the environmental uh, way to lay and camouflage landmines that I was, for me, creating the, the, this concept of a uh, landscape was interesting because the, the the training courses not only um, talked how to create landmines, how to just assemble all the components, but also the creative and cunning strategies to give this wilderness look to, um, to spaces. So some of the things uh, handbooks show are, um, I did like with all the documents when you were just relating how you organize in the different uh, cases and studies you were mentioning. I had uh, I had to finish my my thesis, so I just focus on just this this weapon. But there are a lot of productions, and I, I think some of you working with revolutionary movements, they just have a lot of documentation, and was and it's a problem sometimes just to focus. But I categorize, analyze, codify, and um, analyze some of the handbooks. Um, for instance, some of them just teach how to mix uh, nitrates and things like that to create they, their homemade explosives. Some of them even have the maps, but this is tricky because uh, these numbers, for instance, are the number of steps, but you don't know how long a step is. So there are tricky things there. And also the type of mines was very interesting to find how this is called in Colombia. It's a multivitamin, very famous that is called little red jar, Tarrito Rojo, and even the blueprint in the, in the, in the handbooks, it's a blueprint, a blueprint of that kind of, of a Tarrito, of jar. So um, one thing that was interesting too is, uh, this is not explosives, but as you can see, it's a, a sort of trap. Uh, here in Colombia, we have it and they call it here regularly uh, Trampa Vietnamita, Vietnamese trap. So I found the, uh, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong um, handbook and uh, they have this spikes and kind of system of trap, they call bear trap uh, with punji sticks. And this is FARC handbook with, I think it's almost the same device. The only thing is the, the direction of the, of the spike, oops. Uh, that changes here. So it was very interesting and still it could be just a coincidence, but it was very interesting to find uh, even devices of like, for instance, a bomb bicycle and also a bomb bicycle used by Park. Uh, but uh, the relations are not only in devices, but also in techniques. 
Uh, the SAPER units, for instance, this all, it's available uh, in internet. Uh, this is VC, Vietcong, uh, SAPER. SAPER was a special unit uh, to do like a uh, pretty tactic operations. And you, when you can see, you can see one in Vietcong, also in FMLN in Salvadorian guerrilla, and also in Colombia, where I was, that I, I, I didn't know that much of this when I was doing my field work, uh, but I just found talking after the peace process when some of the miners, some of them former FARC members, and one shared that he <laughs> he was a former member of FARC and he was a they call it light steps, pisa suaves. So uh, it's interesting to find also all the, the 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 dots that connect and referring to to archives. It's interesting that they mention even the term that is a term created by a uh, Viet Cong. Uh, information is only is known by sappers and chief of registry within the fields. So it was interesting to find that tracks. And this may be closer for some of you uh, from IDA and FAR connections. That was a big news here um, uh, and there in, in, in Colombia um, relating to, to, um, to IDA and Colombian connection, but it was not sometimes very widespread because it was in August 2001. And as you remember, September 11, 2001. So this was almost, almost vanished, but it, it's interesting because we have some, a lot of references uh, analyzing the connections, but it was very interesting for me analyzing all these um, handbooks that after 2001, you can find uh, this kind of drawings. Um, also, uh, it's interesting. I don't know how much time I have left. Okay. Um, uh, this is also a methods of uh, Viet Cong marking, like stones, like broken sticks, uh, and also you can uh, see that kind of um, guidance in some of of, of the guerrilla handbooks. Uh, for instance, uh, you can see here in B, uh, signaling. Uh, using stones, rivers, uh, and other location points. So at some point, there are a lot of hints that I just uh, found very interesting to describe this uh, kind of uh, relations. And also as uh, this um, improvised technology of, of our creating these landmines, you can see what every other technology have. Uh, other technology has that is this adaptation and innovation. So for instance, they have the skill experts kind of mind uh, with a deceiving mechanism. This is Eastern block. And then just a innovative um, a spiral from far. They know, um, for instance, uh, this plung plunger uh, shines with the sun uh, is out and they just cut the head of the syringe so and replace it with a stick. So when they are looking for, for things or even using metal, uh, metal detectors, they cannot be aware and just use it effectively. So as you can see, there are a lot of tips. Other thing was uh, seeing the marking uh, strategies to set up areas by Viet Cong. This is Viet Cong and I just, once I, I knew that I was uh, during my field work trying to uh, analyze what are the mainly the main um, ways to mark areas and it change depend uh, it changes depending uh, where you are as you notice we have Pacific Amazon we have desert so they change just to adapt uh, in every place and as the same. A gorilla mentioned, be creative to mine enemy areas, water, mango trees, orange trees, doors, and attractive spots like sightseeing points. So you have a lot of, uh, of these um, hints uh, in the manuals. And this is another one. And the last one, thinking uh, as the enemy thinks, what he's going to do, how he will react, what advantages and disadvantages he will have, where is the best place to lay mines for the true annihilation and what will be the efficacy when they maneuver. So following the movements of the enemy to hunt them and the moment they least expect it. So there are a lot of things that I just want. I'm anthropologist, this PhD was in anthropology. So 
I just was uh, amazed by the amount of information in the hand, but still a uh, opportunity just to do uh, to contrast with uh, with uh, people in the in the in the in, during the field work. So to conclude, uh, explosives handbooks are a valuable source of war archives document guerrilla uh, through their arts. Uh, the thing is, all of the experts I talk with, they have access, they have, they just provide me some. Uh, it's not a national archive of this um, court, uh, in the Peace Court, uh, that they were, uh, they have this macro case, the, the, the archive, they didn't uh, give the archive to, to the justice. So it's uh, it's strange, that's why I, I just, when I saw this amazing space to share this, I just uh, want to highlight how important it is to um, have this to document this revolutionary warfare a la Latin American uh, in order to see these lost links with some other guerrillas and how the knowledge flow. So that is on my end. Liliana, thanks very much. That was also really, really fascinating and intriguing. And I guess um, thinking about possible questions to, to ask, um, I, I want to start in reverse order. Um, Liliana with yours, and then go to James, and then back to Oksana and Victoria. Liliana, when I, when I see the, the core sort of evidence that you've used, I mean, these, these are how-to manuals um, and that are extraordinarily I suppose, risky for researchers just to be accessing. Um, you know, it wasn't 15 or 20 years ago where people in the UK for accessing the wrong kind of document as part of their PhD research um, under, under terrorism laws. Uh, and so I'm just wondering at what sort, if you mentioned it, I, I missed it, so I apologize. But how did that factor into the, the sort of risk uh, assessment that had to go into your doctoral research before you even did this? It sounds like you sort of happened on these materials as, as kind of a, a fortunate uh, byproduct of your field research. I'm just wondering how that factored in at all. And I'd be curious, James, at, at your, James Gregg, at, at your view of, you know, you're talking about more videos of atrocities and, and of people doing their thing. But when it comes to, you know, how-to manuals, that's, that's an, a different sort of ball game. So I'd be curious your observations on that. Um, the second point, I think, James, there was, there was a lot that was really, uh, that was really attention getting about what you did, um, the many things that you did. I was struck by a couple of things. One is, you know, the paramilitary adoption of video game aesthetics is something that reminds me of, you know, West African civil wars in the 80s and 90s, uh, where, you know, paramilitary fighters or, or whatever would be adopting, um, you know, nom de guerre from, from Hollywood movies and, and putting on clown costumes. Uh, while slaughtering villages. Um, and so there's an interesting, interesting. Um, uh, I, I found that to be an interesting feature, but what really struck me, and I'd be looking to James Gow to maybe comment on this, is, you know, I, I can feel the surreality of the exercise you went through to justify your research using, I, I guess, an, an ethics framework that's really oriented towards human uh, subjects when what you're actually dealing with is documentary evidence. And in a sense, you're dealing with the publications of human subjects as human subjects, which sounds like an inversion of what James was talking, James Gow was talking about in terms of you know, treating the, the expert witness as the document. And I, I, I'm kind of curious about what each of you would think of that. Um, and then the third point or set of points, I suppose, comes back to uh, Oksana, and Victoria, and, and you raised some, some fundamental, you know, social science research methods and, and sources types of, of issues. Um, and uh, you're talking about local knowledge production and, and uh, among other things, and the risks to researchers working in a local environment, how to mitigate those risks, how to manage those risks. And in listening to that, you would assume that working remotely would be the quick fix, right? If you're, if you're not working on the scene, then you're not in direct physical harm, you're, potentially avoiding certain pitfalls. But as we can see with you know, James's work, which is working remotely for the most part with these sources 
and Liliana, in your case, a bit of both, I think, um, you know, there are risks to, to working remotely as well, particularly with, with online material or, or, or how-to manuals. So I'd be curious your comments on that. Um, and I see, Joe, you've got your hand up. I do, and I, I wonder if it just makes sense to roll my questions in with yours, because some of them overlap. Uh, yeah. If that's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, uh, hugely fascinated, Liliana, uh, 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 with your, your paper. Uh, uh, some, uh, I shouldn't say this actually out loud, uh, but somewhere I, there, I know where there's a stack of manuals from a, <laughs> a different place that I really ought to do something about uh, um, that should be destroyed because of course, a lot of this stuff could be uh, uh, potentially um, dangerous. But I, I'm just fascinated, was this a, was your this was your whole thesis your whole phd or, or was this a part of it and and uh i mean i know i i can see and we're so grateful that you you you, you sent us uh a, a submission and that you're here today to to, to, to talk about your work because it's fascinating but how did how did how did you frame because it's obviously sits in the department of sociology where you submitted your or anthropology yeah uh, how, how i mean how how do the anthropologists that you know, how does this fit into the structure of the literature and debates in anthropology, and how, did, how was it received um, uh, by by your fellow anthropologists? Um, which takes me to James, um, which um, uh, um, I think uh, um, you would have had uh, uh, less difficulties submitting your ethical approval. Uh, I'd like to think so at King's College because we 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 just have kind of a conveyor belt of uh, parallel. Uh, uh, problems and issues that go through our ethical committees and war studies people sit on some of those so it's, it's a bit you probably would have found that so you know <laughs> uh, uh, but, but 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 you know I, I don't um, want to sell St. Andrew's short they did it they did a good job and they, they, they did a good it, job oh yeah yeah, so, yeah 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 right. yeah I don't want to bad mouth them but I understand no, what no. you're saying yeah yeah we, we, we we've had to it's kind of a almost a routine rather than a uh, 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 unusual case, but uh, um, one of the other things I do, uh, 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 apart from teach international history and uh, history of uh, warfare, is also I teach a course on um, science fiction and war. And um, there's just uh, I, I I had no idea. I just you know I know I knew of the original. Uh, I forgot. I think the name of the, the the of the original book that kicked off the stalker, the film stalker, is called something like Roadside Picnic. And then yeah, that was uh, the novel. That was the film novel. Was yeah. was Stalker. Stalker, yeah. And then, and then, and then it's exploded. And then I had no idea until the students, of course, uh, uh, who, who who are fanatics, told me all about this sort of exploded this war game universe to uh, open that up. But of course, I, I just uh, just just ask you to comment on uh, if if you wouldn't mind expanding on that because there I've I've also read a, a large number of. Uh, recent both uh, journalistic and academic accounts about uh, science fiction or counterfactual history or, you know, sending, you know, um, uh, T-72 tanks back to 1930s Soviet Union and this sort, you know, this sort of thing uh, uh, as kind of a, a huge explosion. Uh, I mean, first of all, I guess the question is, it's, it's obviously just not the Sparta battalion that's, 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 that's framed by this, but how much of this is actually deliberate in the sense that uh, um, there's a there's a, a a deliberate attempt to create a culture of violence and uh, a, a aggressive nationalism that's deliberate because it's being and somebody actually said this is really important and we got to do this or is it just really just kind of a, a feedback loop or they're exploiting something that's there I mean you can imagine kind of uh, um, uh, uh, you could do this in different uh, English language cultures with different kinds of um, games and books and, and perhaps have similar results, but it's probably wouldn't have been orchestrated, but uh, okay. So I'll, 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 I'll leave that to you. And then uh, uh, I think it was Oksana who, who, who was um, uh, a, a fascinating paper and, and it's, it's congratulations on a dual act. Uh, um, uh, but I think you were talking about using sort of a telephone survey uh, as a way of, in a sense, insulating the uh, researcher, uh, but being able to reach the the human subjects. I just wish I, I, when you were talking about, it, I just and of course it would never occur to me to to do that. A and B, I was just fascinated. To, had you actually have you actually tried that? Did it? And and if so, what was the what was the experience? So, I hope those mesh with your questions, Mike, and and I look forward to the answers. 
Yeah, it's it's a long list of questions, and I think um, maybe maybe we'll just leave it to each of the panelists to pick and choose what they want to comment on. Um, maybe we could start again in reverse order and, and go with Oksana and Victoria, and then go to James, and then back to Liliana um, to give everybody a, a first stab at that long list of questions, and then uh, we can go back and forth as necessary after that. So Oksana and Victoria, the, over to you, um, if you want to. Uh, respond well, to all or any of that. Briefly answer to your question about remote. Uh, our idea is that we have to think about challenges and limitations of any method we are using because remote is equally challenging as anything else because even if you are doing Zoom interview, for example, uh, you, you are still endangering the person. The question is that someone can also uh, hijack your interview or where you will be staring or if you need, for example, to send this interview via internet or transform somewhere to the transcriber. So there will be many, many issues, but we have to be aware. And when we publish about the knowledge produced within any specific method that is applied, it's very important to put forward about the limitations. So media or policy makers, everybody understand that we have very limited and possibly biased information about this, this, and this because of that. I will tap also on video gaming just for a few seconds recently in Ukrainian footage of uh, war, there were several cases where uh, there were of in official media videos of shot uh, helicopters or some other uh, war for uh, elements. And then experts uh, immediately discovered that these are from the video games, which are of very good quality. And about the literature, you asked it, this question to James, but, but I would say uh, that there is a very good article by Alexander Zabirko, he's in Germany, but he publishes in English as well, where he analyzes uh, all the literature which appeared in Russia after the beginning of the Donbass conflict. And there were over 200 different books and stories of this historical artificial reality. Thank you, Victoria, and maybe it's several words. Uh, I absolutely agree that uh, our main focus is on limitation. It's very important to talk about limitation and all our discussion was about this limitation. And for example, uh, Victoria says about this remote, it's absolutely possible. For example, it's possible to conduct in-depth interview and focus group discussion. But on the other side, uh, for, for example, uh, if you are working face-to-face, -face, it's other absolutely ch uh, challenging situation. When you are, when you are in the field, uh, uh, in the center of the war. Usually researcher also um, have uh, many different kinds of challenges connected to infrastructure, permits, access to uh, certain areas. Uh, for example, I have one of my research in zero point, and we usually ask the international organization about situation on the front because we need this information for uh, creating this safety place for, for conducting the interview. And it's really uh, 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 so many knowledge you need to have to start such a uh, field work in war zone conflict. And for example, in this case, it's very important to think about this situation when you need some uh, acquiring um, uh, of permission uh, uh, from the local authorities. In this case, you have absolutely limit, uh, uh, limited group to, to access. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, we still talk about this limitation. So, so many examples of this limitation. And, uh, and, 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 and forget. Oh, yeah. Telephone. Telephone interview. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we discussed like a separate issue. Uh, this, uh, inter, uh, this possibility to make a survey using the telephone, uh, uh, using the mobile phone. And in this case, for example, in Donetsk region, we face the problem that uh, this region switched to the Russian mobile uh, uh, networks. And in this case, you uh, uh, have an access only to the part of population which has saved Bosk. Uh, 
cards, uh, Russians and Ukrainian cards. And uh, it's a very big limitation in this case, because if people say the Ukrainian card, it means that they have relatives in Ukraine, that they have a, a, a different kind of a situation that they need to have this contact with Ukrainian territory, but it's a special group of population who live in occupied territory. It's still our conversation about limitation. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. Uh, James, please go ahead. I'll go ahead and just um, jump in, just ad addressing one of the earlier questions about uh, general risk to researchers. I mean, I had to submit a document to MI5 saying that I'm accessing this extremist content on the web. And although I use VPN in a virtual machine and try to protect myself, I'm pretty confident that British intelligence can figure me out. But if you, if those who haven't read uh, yet Victoria and Oksana's piece, I really recommend you do because they talk a lot about um, the psychological effects on researchers of conflict, um, trauma, uh, how try to try, I'm losing, sorry, I'm losing my tongue, but you know, how to kind of deal with that. Uh, I think a lot of that's overlooked and that's a real risk that people of conflict uh, need to contend with. And I really think most of the time they just ignore it. Um, moving on to the second question about the you know, human subjects as documents. I, I completely agree. I just think that my my version of applying it is, you know, it has to do with perspective and intent. And intent, a trial is not a research product. Uh, it's a social, you know, maneuver of trying to get justice. Um, it's not an academic level thing. Um, as far as the the Sparta Battalion content, it's not going anywhere. It, it, it exists. Um, it's this drawing was really just how I could square with myself taking possession and disseminating potentially harmful content. But if you want to find it and access it, it's there. Uh, I would agree that those are the original documents. I think drawing it just really confronts the fact that research and creating a dissertation is a transformative act. It's, it's not without being touched by us as researchers. Um, the last comment or last question, I'm sorry, on um, video games, sci-fi, these things affecting the aesthetics of conflict. It's it's a combination of deliberate and organic processes. With uh, Sparta Battalion, we know it's deliberate. They say so. They're explicit on their VK page being like, we named ourselves after this because um, they thought it was cool and they related to some of the values that they ascribed, uh, attributed, excuse me, to, to the fictional group of the Spartan order. Um, of Metro. Uh, but you know, another example would be uh, on both sides of the conflict, you might see some Ukrainian uh, sources referring to uh, Russian forces as orcs. Um, and there's also some reference to themselves as alliance. This is, you know, not everybody does this. Some people refer to them as orcs just because it's a nasty thing to call them. But some others I've seen on Telegram really use terms from World of Warcraft, the video game. These are the factions, the, the horde versus the alliance. And it's really, I think a, a, it's not new, as you said, in Africa. And it's really a way to dehumanize the enemy, to come to terms with the way, so you don't have to confront the human aspect of your enemy. And it, it sanitizes conflict uh, in a way that's just attractive to people who don't want to, who want to fight. They want to have an adventure. Um, and then they're dealing with the horrific reality. It needs to be contextualized in a way uh, that is influenced by nice pop culture around them. I found typically the romance of it is, is to get you to be there and then you're living in the reality that's very different. Um, and that these, the sci-fi and uh, video game aestheticization is part of the external narrative, the propaganda narrative, the competing propaganda narratives that we as people who aren't in the conflict digest um, and is part of that tug of war. So that's the end of my responses, thank you. Thanks very much, James. Liliana, over to you. Yes, uh, from my end, um, oh, <laughs> uh, risks, uh, the, the advantage, as I mentioned, is that I uh, conducted all my field work after a um, FARC peace process. So I worked for 15 plus years in Colombia. So I lived during the active conflict and at that time, maybe uh, doing this kind of research it should be like a different thing, but I exactly did after, during and after they signed the peace agreement. I can say, uh, I can certainly affirm that now uh, it's a different thing in Colombia. Um, even they are using and reusing some of the handbooks and even just 
recruiting some former FARC members to uh, lay new minds with new innovation strategies. So we even uh, we don't even have a real assessment of what was this uh, use of uh, mines uh, during the 90s and the 2000s and still and now we are having a new spiral so with that said i just uh, think that I, I i didn't have any risk uh, and i'm not aware of any risk that i'm having now because it's a, a gorilla that fi uh, signed the, the peace agreement and all the information was available and i just was an outsider and so they share um this information with an outsider academic but the the sad news is that they are not using this information to have better assessment in each territory uh, in order to move forward the clearance processes in colombia and as you can notice we have a lot of contamination uh, there are a lot of places cleared but still it is a threat and we know the spots we because we have victims or something some animal there, but we still not have a hundred percent assessment or or uh, of where the mines are. And um, to the answer of uh, how did I just um, uh, yes frame up all my uh, all my PhD? This is a part, uh, but it's still uh, this is a part because I was not uh, before. Uh, I was doing this research. I, I, I had no idea of this uh, of this information. I just uh, found it. People share it, so I use it as a way to uh, conduct and as a lead of interview and as a share. I, I did a lot of training in, in in the mining, so it was a good way just to uh, break the ice with the miners and with uh, with other. Uh, people uh, in the field with experts. So um, when I framed the thesis, the, the, one of the parts was environmental anthropology of war, analyzing context, biodiversity spots, for instance, uh, landmines were used to protect coca crops in the most biodiverse places. So there is a, a overlay hotspots, as you can see in the in the presentation. So there is one part of environmental anthropology of war. There is a lot of law and regulation uh, within Colombia, some part of a strategic studies uh, of Maui's revolutionary popular warfare, traditional warfare, all of these concepts that you uh, maybe are very well aware for me was like a shot of a lot of information of strategic studies and also the impact of victims. So it's like uh, one part was the Amazon rainforest and specifically on that part and other was documenting specifically landmines in the Amazon and some uh, one part um, that is the one that I share with you I just frame it in social studies of science and technology as an improvised technology that uh, follows all the patterns of every other technology adaptation innovation uh, networks um, knowledge flow and all of these things and I think with that, I answer the both questions.